These are methods of measuring fluid responsiveness. This information is largely adapted from TrueLearn with some additions from Wikipedia up to date, and this image is from Wikimedia Commons. Fluid responsiveness or volume responsiveness is defined as when a patient has a 10 to 15% increase in their stroke volume after an administration of 50 cc IV fluid bolus. This is more of an arbitrary definition. It's important to have some definition, but um, realistically we know it as your stroke volume going up and ideally seeing an increase in the patient's blood pressure as a result um, from a standard ICU standpoint. Fluid responsive patients tend to be volume depleted with low preload reserve. And the mechanism through which a fluid bolus helps is that it increases your stroke volume, which increases your cardiac output and improves your oxygen delivery to tissues. So if a patient is fluid responsive, it usually means they're fluid down, they have low preload, they need fluid to improve oxygen delivery to tissues. Now there are a number of ways to measure fluid responsiveness. Some are better than others, some are easier than others, and I've listed them across the side here. We'll go through them one by one. The first is maybe the simplest, clinical signs and symptoms. This includes the patient's pulse, blood pressure, capillary refill, and urine output. These tests lack sensitivity and they have poor inter-observer reliability. So one physician might get a different result than a different physician. This indicates tissue hypoperfusion, not necessarily fluid responsiveness. So for instance, if you have poor cap refill, they could uh, just have poor hypoperfusion for a different reason aside from fluid responsiveness. Another way to measure fluid responsiveness is with the central venous pressure. This is also a poor predictor. Um, this is a static measure of your fluid responsiveness, a static measure of your preload, uh, as opposed to a dynamic measure. Another method that's a little bit better is an ultrasound of your inferior vena cava, your IVC. This correlates with your central venous pressure, but it's still a poor predictor. You can assess the width of the IVC under ultrasound, and you can watch it collapse with inspiration. This tends to work better in patients that are mechanically ventilated, that aren't breathing or moving around on their own. Another method is the passive leg raise, and if you're using the passive leg raise, you should also do another test to measure the stroke volume like ultrasound. Passive leg raise is nice because it's reversible, it's repeatable, and it's non-invasive. It works in spontaneously breathing patients with arrhythmias, as well as mechanically ventilated patients with low tidal volume, and you'll see that these are restrictions to the later methods that we'll be discussing. The passive leg raise is unreliable if the patient is hypovolemic, and you can't use it if their legs are restricted, of course, because you need to raise their legs passively. Another method is the pulse pressure variation. This and the last one, the stroke volume variation, are probably the best methods of measuring fluid responsiveness. The pulse pressure variation is uh, calculated according to this equation here. You have the pulse pressure max minus the pulse pressure minimum divided by the pulse pressure mean over a respiratory cycle and averaged over approximately three respiratory cycles depending on the algorithm of your monitors. Now this is determined from your peripheral arterial pressure waveform. So you do need an arterial line, usually in the radial artery in the wrist as shown here. The pulse pressure variation does require mechanical ventilation and it also requires a regular heart rhythm. Arrhythmias would lead to an inaccurate PPV. A PPV that's greater than 10 to 13, the threshold varies, would indicate fluid responsiveness. This is why we were emphasizing the importance of mechanical ventilation and um, having a regular heart rhythm. So the passive leg raise is useful in patients that do not meet these criteria. But of course, it uh, tends to be less accurate and it tends to be less reliable than the pulse pressure variation in a mechanically ventilated and regular heart rhythm patient. The last one is the stroke volume variation, also SVV here. This is calculated similarly to the pressure, the pulse pressure variation, SV max minus SV min divided by SV mean over a respiratory cycle. This is determined from the pulse contours analysis of an arterial pressure waveform. So again, you need that arterial pressure line. This again requires mechanical ventilation, a regular heart rhythm. Uh, it also requires a tidal volume that's uh, at least eight, and the patient should not be taking beta blockers. There are some confounders with your stroke volume variation. Your PEEP can increase your stroke volume variation, and vasodilators can do that as well. Norepinephrine, like a norepinephrine drip that the patient is on, a levo drip can decrease your stroke volume variation. The threshold for this is similar to the PPV. If it's greater than 10 to 13, it indicates fluid responsiveness. I hope this review of methods of measuring fluid responsiveness was helpful, and thank you for listening.